In the 1950s, New Zealand needed workers. The doors were open to Pacific Islanders who arrived in their thousands with hopes of a better life. Many settled in Ponsonby and Grey Lynn, and the area soon became known as Little Polynesia. But by the 70s, the dream of a new life was turning sour. Pacific Islanders found themselves at the bottom of the heap, facing unemployment and widespread racism in a country that no longer wanted them. You give me the impression that you think that Polynesians are being treated as second-class citizens. Is this how you feel? Yeah, we're not getting a uh, fair deal in this society. That's why we're talking about the revolution. That's my Uncle Will. At just 20, he got together with a group of young Pacific Islanders in Māori who wanted to change the world. They became the Polynesian Panthers. My task for today is really simple, and that is to be your spiritual person, to be your backup, to be your supporter. You are going to do great things with your project. You are also going to reclaim a history, a Pacific urban history, um, that many people absolutely do not know. I just can't even contemplate walking down Franklin Road with, with the car and people hurling abuse and calling us niggers and telling us to go home. It just... <laughs> the Polynesian Panthers are part of my history, but I've never really known about them until now. This documentary tells their story. I have a Tongan and Māori whakapapa. I live in Auckland, just a few streets away from where my father and his brothers were raised in Ponsonby in the 1950s. Babe, where's the coffee? Yeah. Dad grew up believing that to get ahead, he had to leave his Tongan heritage behind. I remember, you know, as a kid saying to Dad, you know, my brother and I would be saying, you know, Dad, speak, speak some Tongan to us, tell us some Tongan words. And he was like, no, no, you know, you need to just, you know, do what you're doing, head down, um, you know, bum up, just, you work hard and you just, you just fit in. Te kaha, tino pai tono ho etu. My son goes to a Māori language immersion unit. Te Kaha can celebrate his Māori and Tongan heritage in what is now the biggest Polynesian city in the world. But I'm starting to learn just how hard my uncle's generation had to fight for a whole lot of things my son and I now take for granted. At that time, it was so divisive, you know, you had these cars pulling up, calling a nigger, boom da 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 go home and take off. Well, you know, none of us had the cars, so we couldn't follow them to chase them down, you know. But it got to the stage, and even when, when you're at school, you know, you were just put down at school. Um, you know, I mean, I became a, a prefect, really, because the Polynesians were having a riot at the school that I was. You know, I mean, I wasn't an ideal prefect. I mean... I was a second year six, I played league and basketball, I didn't play first 15 like your dad, you know, I didn't, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. But they made me a prefect because they, we had a riot at the school. And the only, the only way I, I got that solved was because most of the Polynesians knew me on the outside, I was a member of the Nigs. Yeah. So, you know, I quelled it within one month. I became like a cop actually, but I did it because I wanted to get my university entrance accredited, so, you know. You say you used to be gang members? What sort of games? Polynesian games, uh, the ones that were around a couple of years ago. Why did you make the change? What was it that caused you to become what you now call revolutionaries? Oh, the oppression and the racism that we suffer 24 hours a day. We were just really a bunch of young people. Um, our average age at that time was 20. Uh, specifically Māori and Pacific Islanders. This is where it's real crucial that we define the word Polynesian, because basically we were all the same. <laughs> and a lot of us were actually ex-gang members, were street people. We also had students, um, some that made the students. We had people who were students. We also had chapters in prisons. So we had a <clears throat> whole, whole range of different members. Um, we were specifically based in Ponsonby initially, and then we spread out uh, throughout Aotearoa with the furthest chapter being in Dunedin. Wow. 
they were a group of young, mainly, I think, um, New Zealand-born or certainly New Zealand-raised uh, Pacific Islanders who came to New Zealand or were born in New Zealand way before there were significant numbers of Pacific people in New Zealand. Uh, so in a sense, they were part of the same movement as, as, as other young people in New Zealand at the time, uh, but but really um, came, came of age um, and became politically organised uh, at a time when Pacific Island people in New Zealand, as temporary workers, as overseas, Stayers uh, were facing severe um, political persecution. Initially, it was the uh, literature of the Black Panther Party in America that we got attracted to uh, the work they were doing in America. And uh, when we read these books deeper, we found out that the problems they were complaining about were the exact problems that we were seeing in New Zealand. So we decided to do something constructive and form the uh, Polynesian Panther Party. <laughs> The legendary Black Panther Party grew out of the American Civil Rights Movement in the 60s. They were armed, political, and very cool. It's no wonder that when news of the Black Panthers hit the streets of Ponsonby, they captured the imaginations of young Polynesians. Uncle Will and his mates called a secret meeting in a friend's bedroom. It was actually packed. It was packed of uh, all sorts of um, young men from different gangs, different areas. We turned up and it was quite intimidating, really, for me. I mean, I, I was pretty scared. I mean, you know, I thought, oh, gang guys, you know, oh, well, you know, I shouldn't be here. Yeah, in the end, Etta's and parents came home unexpectedly and everyone just shot out the window. <laughs> we all just scarpered. When my father rocked up, I thought, oh, my God. And all the people who were there, he was just, uh, he was devastated. He said, oh, my God, they were up to no good. What are they doing here? So he just quickly told all these boys to get lost, and so everybody just ran. I remember feeling really kind of excited to be part of this change thing that was mm -hmm. happening, you know, that maybe we've got a chance to do something. Um, and so, yeah, we were all keen to join. And they joined in force, with chapters opening across New Zealand. The central headquarters was in the heart of Ponsonby. So we basically, our organisation was above this building. So where was the entrance? The entrance was round about here. So you have fond memories of, of this place? You know, it was good because, I mean, it made us feel like we were established, you know. Yeah, you know yeah. it, was, it was like a step up from a gang. Yeah. Now we had an office. office. <laughs> And so, what would kind of go on up there, like your headquarters, what was up there? Well, we, that was where we had our meetings um, and had people come in you know, when they had problems. There was always something happening. Um, it would be something like uh, needing to go around and do a, a, a mailbox drop or something. Or there would be a demonstration against American imperialism happening in the People's Union and we need to go and support it. So we're there painting posters, placards. In just a few short years, this group of ex-street gang members and students had reinvented themselves as a political movement. They were lobbying in government, fighting for human rights and helping their community with everything from housing, food packages and education to prison visits and legal aid. They even had an employee. So um, I was um, over at Uncle Will's the other day and he, he showed me this. Was that some of your mahi? 1974 diary from, from the offices of the Polynesian Panther. My God, that's my writing, all right, Peter Howard. This is when I was the um, community worker for the Polynesian Panther Party. You were the only person that was actually employed by the Polynesian Panthers to kind of run all the administration and, and do all of that. And was that based up at Three Lamps Fire? Yes, um, up in Ponsonby Road, our first um, HQ we had there used to be West End News and, um, and we used to go out and deliver papers to pay the rent for it. <laughs> <laughs> So you people would call the office, like mm. you, you guys people, are almost like a first stop yep. for Especially people that yeah, were Pacific in need. Island and, and Māori, yeah. One of the first things we got, there were children getting killed at Franklin Road. Um, there was no pedestrian crossing. I um, got on to Auckland City Council and, you know, and demanded that we have a pedestrian crossing there because there was no pedestrian crossings along Ponds Road, particularly Franklin Road. Kids actually killed along here. Yeah, yeah. There were two kids got killed before we got into action, and so. Noi and kids, eh? Yeah, yeah. 
And so basically we went down to the council and told them, look, they've got to fix up, do something about these crossings, that kind of stuff. We gave them a period of time to get it done. I think it was three weeks, I think, or something. Um, and then nothing happened. So we decided to come then and just do a protest along here. And Amma was the one that was um, um, ahead of, the, of, this, of this project. And so we had traffic banked up all the way down that way down here. That's when the cops come flying in. And the cops came flying in and sort of said, what are you doing? And that kind of stuff. And they said, well, we want to get this crossing fixed up. And then three weeks later, they put the lights up. Hard to believe, you know, I live just down there. I never even knew that, you know, what you guys had done up here. I'm discovering a whole new side to my uncle. In my late teens and early 20s, I was all about having a good time. But at that age, Will and his Polynesian panther mates had already started their fight for social change. Uncle Will has sent me to Rotorua to meet Nigel and Vicky, a panther romance who decades later are still together. He's Indian and she's Māori, so I'm curious about how they became central to the Polynesian panther movement. Mm. I was the only Indian <laughs> in Ponsby virtually that, and all my mates all, were all Polynesians. And, this, and I was never actually a member of the Polynesian Panthers. I was like an honorary member. <laughs> That's what they said, you're an honorary member. And after a while they said, no, 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 you're, you're blood. That's all there is to it, and that's how I ended up with the Pampas. They all had this belief in this kaupapa where they were going to fight for their people, even though Will was Tongan, you know, Vince was Samoan, all Polynesians to them were the same, and they were doing their best for their people, and Nigel was doing his best for all his whānau all the Polynesian whānau here. It's the first Panther office. Oh, wow. Who's that in the That front was on Ponsby Road. Yes, yes. And it's... Um, Down uh, Three Lamps in day. Eh? Yep, right yep. on the end of the corner. I've got a photo here yeah. for you, actually, um, that my uncle gave me. And who's that, Fox? Let's see that. Ah, holy heck. So is that Tingy and you? Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. And what have you got there? What are those? This is... Um, this wall there. Ah, oh, it is too. Pacific Island immigrants valued education, but often parents didn't have the time or language skills needed to help their kids with their studies. So the Panthers became heavily involved in homework centres. A homework class organised by a local school teacher, and Panthers are amongst the helpers. Nigel is a fifth former at a local high school. Normally he supervises another class down the road, but tonight it's school holidays and only one class is operating, so he's come to help here instead. Reverend Beck was the one who gave us the church on Ponsby Road for homework centre, and plus he put a little pool table in. Well, put a pool table, a ping pong table, get the kids to come in. A lot of teachers gave um, free time after school just to come and help. They'd go home and we wouldn't start the centre up till say six o'clock, so you have your dinner and whatever, and then go to the centre. Other Panther-inspired operations are a bus carrying visitors, amongst them volunteer Panthers, to Paramaroma Prison every Saturday. The prison visits were set up for a lot of the young, young, especially like Waikiri and that, was for the younger ones that had just gone in, first, first time they'd ever been in prison, alone, didn't know no one. Their parents, didn't even own a car or anything like that. They couldn't go down to visit them. So what, when the prison visit started, we set up a roster and said, OK, these are names of prisoners that have not, never had a visit. And Nigel told me that you spent your um, wedding night at the prison instead of on your honeymoon. Yeah, yeah. Registry office downtown, Jesus Christ Superstar movie, and then we had a program to perform, that is go and visit the brothers out at Paremoremo. Um, the fact that we loved each other and were part of the Polynesian Panthers, we had work still to do, and that was go and see the brothers in prison. Because we know if a brother says, I've sent you an invite, please come, and we don't turn up, it's the saddest thing on earth you know, to have a brother locked up and his visit doesn't come through. 
The Panthers' prison visits were just one of their many social programs. Back home in Ponsonby, they were battling poverty and exploitative landlords. It's in conditions like these that many Polynesian, and indeed other immigrant families, are forced to spend their first years in New Zealand. The houses are a breeding ground for a multitude of social problems, problems which are often unfairly blamed on the immigrants themselves. I just remember my own cousin's house. That was the least accommodation. and uh, The floorboards were rotten and there'd be no insulation at all around the walls. You could lie there at night and you'd just hear the rats running all over the floor. Leaks all the time, this one does. Yeah. In Freeman's Bay, there are a lot of houses that were like that. Then you flush it, then you come back, you wait for it to fill again, then you've got to turn the tap off, otherwise it floods at the back of the toilet here. We would uh, quite often be in situations where the landlord would have uh, hired a security firm to come down and evict the person from the flat for not paying rent. So we would go down there and barricade ourselves in with the tenant and the security firm would come down um, and physically try and remove us uh, and we just wouldn't move. And, and this sent a message to the landlords that this was another part of justice, another part of fairness uh, that we're not going to tolerate anymore. And you want us to live in the substandard housing and pay this amount, pay quite a high rent for what you're giving us. And you want us to be quiet about that? It isn't going to happen. I don't think I've ever really understood just how tough things were for our people. No wonder the Panthers felt like they had to take action. I've met some of them now, but I'm keen to see how the Panthers were seen at the time. They learned how to use the media, and considering their age, handled it well, even though they faced some pretty entrenched attitudes. Polynesians and Maoris have, have got a bit of a reputation for violence, um, for breaking bottles over people's heads and sticking their boot in and that sort of thing. Do you not really believe that this happens? Uh, it happens, yeah, but... Um the fact that news media, like yourselves and that, um, really blow it out of proportion. You know, like, it's something to give to the public, eh? Media representations of violent, alcohol fueled Polynesians led police to form a special task force charged with cleaning up the inner city. Task force at that time was specifically targeting uh, pubs or public areas that were predominantly patroned by Māori or Pacific Islanders, or as we term Polynesian. And they were just specifically going around and just picking up people for just stupid, little petty little crimes. The police, in their wisdom, think, OK, these people can't control themselves, can't handle the piss, we'll arrest them all because they, they all seem to be doing the same thing, uh, getting violent. So we bear the name of violent Pacific Island, violent.